Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video, we're going to talk about four spirometry. You know why four spirometry is so important? Because it's useful for pulmonary function tests to determine if someone has an obstructive or restrictive pulmonary disorder. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this curve. Now, before we do this, let me explain to you what's actually happening for this actual graph to be registered. Okay? So when someone's doing four spirometry, you take this apparatus called a spirometer. And what you do is you take in as much air as you forcefully can. Right? So you, and then at that point, you start breathing into the four spirometer, all right, then the spirometer with the most, as, as much forceful expiration as possible. So you're taking in as much air as you possibly can forcefully, and you're expiring as much air as you possibly can forcefully. So in other words, and then what you do is going to be registered on this graph, okay? Now, since we're doing this, the point that we need to look at for certain types of obstructive and restrictive pulmonary disorders is two points in this curve. One point is how much air were we able to forcefully expire within the first second of that expiration. So during the first second of expiration, how much air were we able to forcefully expire? So let's say we take this graph here and I move up from this right here, because this is our time. You know, on this graph here, time is in the x-axis, it's in seconds. Here on the y-axis is volume, and it's in liters, right? So I come up from this one point here. So I'm gonna come up, and it's gonna be approximate, guys. It's not gonna be perfect, it's just gonna be approximate. And I'm gonna come up over here a little bit, and it's gonna be around four, okay? So if I come up from that one point, hit it, come over, okay, it's right around four liters, okay, give or take. We're gonna round it off to four. Okay, what do you call that point in which you monitor how much air you're forcefully expiring in one second? It's called the FEV of one second. So what do we call this point right here? This point right here is called the forced expiratory volume. So I should make all of this capital here. Forced expiratory volume at one second. Okay, so it's the forced expiratory volume, the amount of air that you can forcefully expire within the first second of that forced expiration. The next point that we care about is we care about what is the maximum, the, the most amount of air that we can forcefully inspire and expire. So you'll find that by the highest point of the curve. So where is the curve at its highest point? So if I look at it, it's not going to be perfect, but I'm going to say it's about right here. So I'm going to say that's the point at which the curve is about its highest point. Okay? If that's the case then, I'm going to move this over to the left. And I'm going to hit what it is on the volume. And if you want, we can figure out, okay, what was the time about? It's not necessarily that significant for the time because we don't care what time it was. We just want to know at what point was the actual amount of volume that the individual forcefully inspired and expired, what was the point at which it was the highest on the graph? That point in which it was the highest on the graph tells us how much air this person can forcefully inspire and how much the person can forcefully expire. That's called forced vital capacity. So forced vital capacity is the total volume of air that you can forcefully inspire and expire. It's the highest point on the graph. So this would be called the FVC, forced vital capacity. Now, why is all of this significant? Okay, so let me explain to you. We're going to take these, some people, they, the intelligent individuals out there, they said, what if we take this forced expiratory volume at one second and we make a ratio of it? We compare this to this. So look what they did. They made this formula. And what they did is they said, if we take the forced expiratory volume, right, at one second, and I put that over the forced vital capacity. So I'm going to put that over the forced vital capacity. So my FVC. I can determine something. Because whenever I get this number, I'm going to get a decimal. But then what I'm going to do is there's no, they're all in the same units, right? Because this is going to be liters. This is going to be liters. So I can put that here on the side. This is in liters. And this unit right here will be in liters. What they said is, okay, well, I, I'm going to get a decimal out of this. Let's take and multiply whatever answer we get out of this by 100, all right? 
So whatever answer we get out of this, let's multiply it by 100, and we'll get a nice percentage. Okay, pretty sweet. So look what they did. And this is taking into consideration normal, okay? So they did a normal calculation. So let's say that this person that's exhibiting this spirometer is exhibiting a normal breathing pattern. Normal FEV, FEV normal FVC. So if we look at this, it's about four for this FEV, right? Because we come up from that one second, we have to look here, it has to be at one second. We have to find the point at which it's at one second. And we, son of a gun. Let me follow this up here. From one second, we go up and we go to the four point. That is the FEV of one second. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that number and I'm gonna plug it in up there. So again, what would this number be here? This would be four liters. So it's gonna be, here, I'll put it here in the bottom, four liters and it's gonna be over the force vital capacity. What is my force vital capacity? Okay, let's come back over here. It's the highest point in the curve. Well, if I come here, it doesn't matter what time it is, it just says, okay, it took you four seconds during the expiratory process to reach your force vital capacity. That's all it's saying. But if I come over here to the left, this will tell me how much volume, how much air I actually expelled. Okay, that is actually five liters. Okay, cool, let me write that down. So if I take four liters over five liters, um, this is approximately about a 0.8, right? So this is approximately about uh, 0.8. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply this 0.8 by 100. What does that give me? That gives me 80%, okay? Gives me 80%. This is taken into consideration. If this is the number that you get, this is considering that this person has normal pulmonary function. Okay, normal pulmonary function. Obviously within a standard deviation of a little bit, right? Because every person might not have exactly 80% on their actual pulmonary function test. But this gives you that there is normal pulmonary function. Okay, but like anything, it's good to know what things are normally, but it's more important to know how these things are, you know, failing. What happens if there's actually less than 80? What happens if there's greater than 80? Okay. So let's say for a second, all right, we look at a, someone who's actually going to have what's called an obstructive pulmonary disorder. So there's two types of disorders that can affect this. So one, so we took at these pulmonary disorders. Out of these pulmonary disorders, there's going to be two main types here, right? One is going to be obstructive and the other one is going to be restrictive. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. What I just wanna get across here is, how is this actually related to this force spirometry? When people who have obstructive pulmonary disorders, these individuals, when you look at obstructive, like what is an example of an obstructive pulmonary disorder? This would be like um, emphysema, this would be like chronic bronchitis, um, even asthma is categorized as technically, it's actually categorized as an obstructive pulmonary disorder. A lot of debate on this one. Some people say it's restrictive. Uh, generally though, it's actually categorized as obstructive pulmonary disorder. But these are obstructive pulmonary disorders. In this situation, I'm gonna write it down, I'm gonna explain it, but I'm gonna write it down for right now. In people who have obstructive pulmonary disorders, their percentage is usually less than 80%. They usually have less than an 80% on their pulmonary function test. Less than 80% generally. Let me explain why. If we take that formula over there for the actual FEV over the FVC, think about this mathematically. If the FEV, okay, I'll keep this consistent. I had all these capitalized, right? If this is FEV, at one second over what? Over FVC, all right, over my FVC. Watch this. Think about this in mathematical terms. If this number is larger, the percentage goes up. If this number is smaller, the percentage goes up. Let me make this just real easy for you guys. Both the FEV and the FVC in these type of situations, they don't go up, they generally go down. So in other words, FEV of one second is gonna go down and it's gonna cause one of these two disorders. Restrictive, FVC or FEV is gonna go down in one of these two disorders. We're gonna determine which one. So if both of them go down, well if the FEV goes down, 
that'll make the percentage, oh, that'll make it smaller. If the FVC goes down, oh, that's gonna make the percentage bigger. So in this situation, these individuals have a very, very low FEV of one second. So in other words, if you were to look at the graph, where would theirs be? They might, if we were to potentially make like a, another curve here, let's say I do it with actually with this purple here. We would expect the curve to, do, to look a little bit like this then. I'm gonna come here, All right? They might have the same, their FVC might drop a little bit, but what the, the main purpose of this is trying to see this. What would it be like right there, okay? So we don't even really need this. Let's get this out of the way so we don't actually confuse this. What would you expect the curve to look like in general at this point right there? So if we come up to this point here, this is their new FEV. And if I follow this over, what is it? It's a lot less than four. Okay, so these individuals, you're gonna see that they're gonna have a decrease in the FEV at one second. And this is categorized during obstructive pulmonary disorders. Whereas someone who has a restrictive pulmonary disorder. So if you think about a restrictive pulmonary disorder, uh, what are the types of restrictive? There's so many different types, we're not gonna go over all of them, but generally it's anything like you know tuberculosis, um, even any type of interstitial lung disease, regardless of the etiology, whether it be inflammation, infection, whatever. We're just gonna put here interstitial lung diseases like pneumonitis and different types of situations like that, okay? So things like that. Let me actually put this volume over here so we can stay consistent here, so we can keep coming down here. So again, over here on this y-axis, just so you know, this is going to be volume, specifically in liters. So interstitial lung diseases, and there's other things, pulmonary fibrosis, just scarring too. So you can even say as people get older, like just the general pulmonary, pulmonary fibrosis. Okay, but either way, what happens with these individuals? They usually have a pulmonary function test that's greater than 80%. So their pulmonary function test is usually greater than 80%. Why? Look at the formula. Let's say here's the formula. If we go here and we say that there's the FEV at what? One second over what? Over the FVC. So it's over the FVC. And we said only one of these, okay, and each one of these, one of them is gonna drop. Neither of them are really going up in this case, all right, in this situation. So this one went down, so obviously this one's gonna have to go down. And this should make sense because if this number goes down, if your FVC goes down, what happens to the overall number? It goes up. So the percentage goes up, and that's why they have a greater than 80% pulmonary function test. Before I show this, let me actually show what it would look like in the graph again. What would you see for these individuals? Well, if we were to follow another curve, just uh, let's do this one in this green color here. I were to come here, I'm gonna come just right next to, right along with the actual FEV. Sometimes these individuals' FEV can drop, but we're not looking at it for that reason. We're looking at it for the FVC. So again, come to this point here, the highest point in the actual curve. Where would you find the highest point in the curve? It looks like it's somewhere around here. And I would follow it over again, and as I follow this over, I would notice what? The FEC went down. Okay, so that's what you see inside of the actual graph. You'd see this abnormality where this went down, whereas in this obstructive, this would go down. Last thing to finish it off, why is this FEC, FEV decreasing, and why is this FEC decreasing? Okay, think about this. Son of a gun. Think about this simply here. Let's take, we take this obstructive pulmonary disorder. The best example, the easiest example for this one is emphysema, okay? So the easiest one for this example is emphysema. So we're gonna use that as our example, okay? So in emphysema, we're not gonna go over the entire mechanism, but if you guys remember, we talked about it a couple times, that it's going to be this situation where you're destroying a lot of the elastic tissue. And that elastic tissue is really, really important, right? Because it controls a little bit of the, the natural lung elasticity, the lung wanting to recoil. So we're gonna represent that by this uh, blue color here. So let's say all of this blue structure here is representing elastic tissue. All of this is elastic tissue. Well, what happens in individuals who have emphysema? And again, what does this elastic tissue do? Just so that we're clear here. The elastic tissue is trying to recoil the lungs to make the lungs want to snap back. And why is that important? Because that helps for being able to get air out. So that's one thing, so it's recoil, inward, 
recoil of the lungs passively, right? In emphysema, you're losing a lot of this elastic tissue because you're actually breaking up the alveolar walls and making the alveolar chambers larger. As that happens, what starts happening to the lung? Well, now it doesn't have as much inward recoil. So now look what happens. If you imagine for a second, it loses its elastic tissue. If you inflate the lungs, it's gonna inflate really easily now because there's not much elasticity. So the elasticity is actually going to be really low in this case. So in this situation, as someone who has obstructive pulmonary disorder, the elasticity of the lungs, elasticity, decreases, and the compliance of the lungs increases. If the compliance of the lungs increases, then what's gonna happen then? These lungs are gonna be really stretchy, but they're not gonna be able to recoil. If they can't recoil, what's the problem there? They can't get air out, it's that simple. With restrictive, with these individuals, it's the exact opposite situation. So let's say we take the lung again over here for this individual. We'll do it in a different color. Let's do this one in red. Let's say here I draw this lung, right? And in this lung, if we have here, we have the actual airway coming in and supplying the alveoli again. In this lung, it has its normal amount of elastic tissue to you know allow for the lung to have an inward recoil, right? But then guess what happens in these individuals? Let's take some type of pulmonary fibrosis as an example here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna add in some fibrous tissue. Let's show that with this uh, maroonish color here. So this maroonish color here is representing fibrous tissue accumulation. As this fibrous tissue is accumulating, what is it now doing to the actual lungs? It's making them way more elastic. So now the elasticity in this case is increasing, but the actual compliance is what? Decreasing. So if their compliance is decreasing, the lungs are not going to want to expand. And that's what happens because force, what is the definition of force vital capacity? It's the amount of air that you can forcefully inspire and the amount of air that you can forcefully expire. If these individuals have a very low compliance, their lungs don't want to expand. So they don't even really ventilate their lungs properly. So there's not really much air coming out generally, right? So because there's not a lot of air actually generally coming in, there's not gonna be a lot of air actually going out. So in these individuals, that's why they have this force out of capacity that is lower than normal. All right, engineers, in this video, we covered a uh, force spirometry. We talked about the clinical correlations with it. And we even went through some calculations and related it with the graph. I hope all of this made sense. I hope you guys really did enjoy it. If you did, please hit the like button, comment down in the comment section, and please hit that subscribe button. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.